Thank you very much for the very nice invitation. Let me, and thank you, Professor Sipianas, for a very nice presentation also about neurosurgery. I'm gonna to come to that in a, in a minute again. Uh, I'm really going to focus for this uh, management of high-grade gliomas and on treatment modalities. And as you know, uh, there are focal modalities, radiation therapy, neurosurgery, and there are systemic therapies like chemotherapy. And I think the first important point that we need to make is that surgery seems to be working. Actually, we don't have very much data about that, but we do have mostly retrospective data that are showing that patients that undergo for, with glioblastoma, for example, in, in, in this trial, that undergo complete resection have a better outcome than those that undergo a partial resection that do have a better outcome than those that have a biopsy. Now, again, I want to point out the role of the surgeon is to remove as much of the tumor as possible, but without affecting the clinical outcome of the patient, meaning that the patient must come out of the operating room as fit as he went in, or at least as fit or even in better shape than what he, he went in. And, and the, the main issue with the fact that those are retrospective work is that there might be some confounding factors like localization and so on, or smaller tumors because the neurosurgeon can, uh, can attack those. Whereas in larger, uh, more aggressive tumors, he might not be able to, to do that in certain situations. Uh, but so clearly a complete resection seems to play a certain role in the outcome of patients with high-grade glioma. The other thing we know for a very long time period is that radiation therapy works also. And those are very, very old trials. You see this is the end of the 70s. But you see basically that as soon as you are removing radiation therapy, this is arm A and B without radiation therapy, you are doing much more poorly than if you have radiotherapy that's being included. This is true in, in this trial from 1978. It's also true here where the worst arm is the one that did not have any radiation therapy included in the treatment. And we have thought for very, very long periods of time that chemotherapy played absolutely no role in the management of high-grade gliomas. And this is a trial that was published in 2001, and you realize we added PCV to radiation therapy, and you don't need a statistician to tell you that there is absolutely no difference between the two groups. But as you know, we know now that chemotherapy actually plays a very important role in the management of glioblastoma. And this is thanks to Roger Stoup, who's going to talk later on in this talk, who did this huge phase three trial that demonstrated the use of timozolomide in combination with radiation therapy to improve the outcome of patients with glioblastoma. You see, basically, the principle is that the patients get about six weeks of uh, radiation therapy, a total of uh, 60 gray in fractions of two, two grays. They get daily timozolomide during the whole course of radiation therapy. And then they get cycles of maintenance timozolomide afterwards. You have to be careful about uh, liver toxicity, about platelet toxicity, and about uh, pneumocystis carini, the risk of lung um, uh, infections needs to be accounted for and managed properly. And when you do that, you see that patients that receive radiation therapy by themselves are uh, doing more poorly than patients that get the combination of treatment. The difference is about two months in median overall survival, so not a massive difference. The very important difference comes in this phase here, at the late phase of the patients. What you are seeing is that there are actually twice as many long-term survivors uh, when you use this treatment in comparison to when you use radiation therapy by itself. So that's quite an important difference, and this is really the patients we are fighting for. Uh, and offering this treatment. We also know that uh, the MGMT uh, methylation status plays an important role. MGMT is an enzyme that basically corrects the damage that's induced by the chemotherapy. So the more MGMT you have, the less efficient the chemotherapy is going to be. And uh, the less MGMT you have, the more effective the therapy is going to be. And measuring this, this is work by Monica Hege from Lausanne also. When you see that the, methylation, the promoter of MGMT is methylated, you do see, uh, so non-expressed, you really see a very nice difference. And you see the patients that receive radiation therapy by themselves are actually doing much more poorly than patients that, that get the combination treatment. And on the opposite, patients with a lot of the MGMT enzymes uh, where the promoter is unmethylated, so active, 
uh, you see that the difference is absolutely minimal uh, between the patients that receive radiation therapy alone or those patients that receive the combination of the two. Um, the question is always how many maintenance cycles should we give to patients uh, with glioblastoma? Uh, I insist on the fact that the trial has shown that six cycles it has been used in the clinical trial. And all the trials we have done afterwards, uh, because in the United States, many, many doctors were giving 12 or 18 or 24 cycles of timozolomide have not been able to show that this had any additional advantage in comparison to the six cycles of timozolomide. Uh, so really, we recommend to stick to the six cycles. The big advantage is that if the patient is able to complete the six cycles without progression, he gets a period where he has uh, time off, where his bone marrow can recover, and you can actually use timozolomide again if he were to recur at a distance from the timozolomide maintenance with good chances of working. Um, an important aspect is also for elderly patients. And you know that one of the key prognostic factors is the general health of the patient, is his fitness uh, to go. And this is especially true in elderly patients. And again, what you see on the passport, the, 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 the official administrative age is not necessarily the same as the biological age. And you can ima easily imagine that an older patient that is able to run marathon still is not going to be the same one as these older patients that are, have a lot of difficulties even just moving. Uh, when we look at elderly patients, there was a trial published quite recently that, again, uh, did exactly what Roger Stubb did, did in his trial in 2005, compared radiation therapy alone in elderly patients uh, to radiation therapy and timozolomide. And again, the findings are exactly the same as, uh, as for the general population. You see that there is an advantage in combining the two treatments for, uh, when you regard PFS. Uh, this is maintained when you, regard, when you look at uh, overall survival. And again, the methylation status of MGMT plays a key role to predict which patient is going to be able to, to, answer, to, to respond to the timozolomide treatment. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Can we do more? So the first important trial that we have probably seen was published in 2019. is done by our colleagues from Germany, where they tried and figured out that maybe uh, giving two alkylating agents might be more efficient in patients that have newly diagnosed glioblastoma with methylated MGMT, so a good likelihood to responding to the alkylating agent. This is expected to be quite, uh, well, first of all, the rationale behind that, you would say, but why give two agents that have the same mechanism of action? It doesn't really make sense. Actually, it does, because uh, whereas timozolomide is really marking, sorry, is really marking uh, DNA, uh, guanines on DNA with a methyl group, which is sort of a signal that there is a mismatch in the, in the cells. And if, that, if there are enough of those signals, the cell will, will go into apoptosis. Uh, Lomustin has an additional effect and is able to actually uh, initiate double, brain, uh, brain, uh, du double bonds, uh, covalent bonds between two, the two strands of DNA, meaning that these two uh, strands of DNA uh, on the chromosome will not be able to separate themselves. So there is a second toxicity to that, uh, which could be a huge advantage for uh, the patient. The, the, the rationale behind that is clear, but there is a worry that actually this might be highly toxic. And this is the way that they did the clinical trial. This has been a multicentric phase three trial, although limited by the number of patients because it was a completely academic trial without pharma support. But basically, you're seeing here on the top exactly the standard treatment of radiation therapy and timozolomide. And on the lower part, what you're seeing is the six weeks of radiation therapy and you know that lomustine has a toxicity window of six weeks, meaning that the platelets will drop around four to five weeks afterwards and recover after six weeks. So basically what they did is give cycles of five days of timozolomide, and on the first day of each one of those timozolomide cycles, the patient would get a lomustine. And since there was a risk of toxicity, uh, the idea was really to start with a low dose of timozolomide and lamustine, and if there is no toxicity, increase the timozolomide progressively. And if there is toxicity, you start by reducing the lamustine, and then you reduce timozolomide. 
The results of this trial are sort of interesting because the first important thing to know is that there is absolutely no effect on progression-free survival between the two arms. And when you look at the result in this Lancet Oncology paper, you are a little bit blocked because I show you two graphs uh, that come out. And what you're seeing, uh, which graph would you pick to have the better outcome? I think we would all agree that this graph here looks somewhat better than the other one, and we would pick this one. Uh, this is the one that has been published in Lancet Oncology, but actually is based on a modified intention to treat population because the um, uh, trial authors realized that there was a mismatch, a misbalance uh, from the smaller institution that got more patients treated with lomostin and timozolomide compared to lomostin alone. So this is the modified intent to treat pro uh, patients co cohort, and this is the intent to treat cohort. So we don't really know whether there is something behind there or not, and obviously we wouldn't need a larger trial to, to be convinced that we should combine these treatments every single time for the patients. And uh, yeah, this is exactly what I mentioned to you. So we reduced uh, 63 to 66 patients versus 69 to 72 uh, patients in this population. And again, one of the risks that you might have is that actually the cohort of patients that were exposed to both lomacine and timozolomide was exposed to much less timozolomide than the standard arm. So that may be a risk that you're actually undertreating the patients. Another risk is obviously if you're using uh, lomustine or, or, or this family of alkylating agents right at the beginning, you, do, you don't have this option anymore at recurrence later on. Uh, another thing that I want to spend two words uh, to mention it, just because I think that it's, it's cool and it's impressive to look, it's something called tumor treating fields. Uh, basically, it's using electricity uh, and when you generate a field that's strong enough and at the right frequency, you are able to block cell division in the sense that the cells will have, will have very much difficulties separating the chromosome evenly between the two daughter cells of a dividing cell. And if this happens, this cell will die. If it doesn't, it will be subjected to the electric field for the next cell cycle. And there is a risk, again, that this may happen and may kill the cells. So in vitro, this works wonderfully well. It has also been demonstrated that there is a role that actually immune-mediated cell death plays a role in there, autophagy plays a role in there, that DNA repair is compromised, and that cell migration are compromised also. All important things for glioblastoma. Obviously, you will need to get electricity and this field for very long periods of time, uh, typically 18 hours a day, meaning that you need to wear a battery and the device that generates electrical field, and you need to have the arrays the, uh, to generate this electrical field on the head. The rationale was to use that first in glioblastoma because it's easy to stick the electrodes on the head. Glioblastoma is a very aggressive tumor. Uh, there is a clear need to have something to work. Honestly, at the beginning, I think nobody thought that this could be working. But amazingly, uh, there was a phase three clinical trial in newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients. And those patients were treated with uh, radiation therapy and timozolomide. And at the beginning initiation of maintenance after an MRI, they were randomized to receive either timozolomide by itself, so standard STUP treatment, or the combination of timozolomide and Optune. And uh, patients were allowed or were actually uh, taught to continue with the device until the end of the second progression. And what you're seeing uh, in this phase three trial is quite impressive in the sense that you are seeing, again, a difference in progression-free survival. You are seeing a difference in overall survival. You go from 16 to 20.9 months. Uh, this is quite a significant hazard ratio of 0.63. And again, very importantly, you see that there, is, there are long-term survivors and they are actually doubling the rate of patients that are still alive at three, four, and five years. You go from five to 13%. I think that's quite significant, the number uh, in there. So uh, that's something that's very promising and needs to be implemented now. Problem is that glioblastoma, usually whatever you do, they come back. Uh, what options do we have a treatment? Obviously, you will have to consider if it's localized, whether you can do another surgery. Uh, Re-radiation is something extremely experimental. There are two ways of doing that. It's either 
as a focal steroid tactic irradiation, uh, which is basically replacing the neurosurgeon. Uh, you can also, and patients are, are doctors are starting to discuss radio radiation. This is very experimental at the moment. Treatments that are approved on the chemotherapy level uh, by the uh, Food and Drug Administration of the United States or in Europe is timozolomide and these alkylating agents like lamustine and carmistine. In Switzerland and in the US, you have uh, Avastin, Bevacizumab, a monoclonal antibody against VEGF. Uh, Optune could be approved. And there are a number of treatments that we use from time to time without very good evidence that they are working. Just I wanted to remind you that lomustine is an active agent at recurrence. This is really the treatment that needs to be beaten. If you, if you design a clinical trial at recurrence, you need to be better than patients that receive CCNU. And this is, has been extremely complicated over the last 10 years. I think none of the drugs have really managed this milestone, and uh, meaning that CCNU really remains a standard of care at recurrence. A uh, few words about Avastin. It's called Bevacizumab. It's a monoclonal antibody against VEGF. It, it, it's a compound that is able to really reduce the size of the tumors and decrease the, the contrast enhancement absolutely massively. The question has always been whether this is really just radiologic, you're seeing an improvement there, or whether really it kills the cells also. What we do know is, uh, and this is a very nice work done with another anti-angiogenic anti agent, Cedirinib, is that there is a very rapid correction of permeability in there. So suggesting really that we're losing the signal actually that's below, uh, that's hidden behind uh, the contrast enhancement, and maybe that the cancer cell remains there. Uh, but it still has a very important effect for the patients. It reduces the size of the tumors extremely massively. It has a very strong anti-edema effect for the patients, meaning that very often they will show a very important improvement in, uh, in symptoms. There have been a phase three trial that compared lomustine by itself versus lomustine and avastin. This is an OTC trial led by Wolfgang Bick. And you really see this effect on progression-free survival, which you remind you in uh, neuro-oncology is most often radiological uh, imaging. So you see that really patients are doing better radiologically and often clinically for longer periods of time. But this does not translate in an effect on, of overall survival. Uh, and with this, I thank you for attention.